Um, so just, I'm Natasha Schull. I'm here at MIT. I'm, um, this has been really fun uh, symposium so far. Uh, and I, I, I had a lot of uh, fun on my own in the, in the past week or so, uh, immersing myself in the work of those on this panel. So Carrie originally told me she had planned to have uh, this session be the very first to begin this symposium, um, following the empiricist view that sensing precedes perception. But as she moved down the road of conference organizing, she realized uh, that for the neuroscientists in the mix, it wasn't apparent that that was the place to begin and that many things are happening before the threshold of sensing and action. So here we are finally at that threshold. Uh, but I want to start my introduction by picking up uh, on some of the themes of the keynote session yesterday. Um, in various ways, I see this panel as a continuation of that uh, conversation. So what I noticed yesterday uh, was that Latour and Poggio shared not only Napoleon um, across their two talks, but also two very similar dances. Uh, in both dances, there was a race away from something towards something else. Um, then there was a halt, a moment of horror, uh, and a backing away, a slow backing away. Um, so in the case of the angel of Geo story, uh, the, the, the sensitivity, the sensitizing um, to this event uh, happens after the confrontation with horror and the shock. Um, in the case of, uh, let's call her the angel of Volvo's story, um, the, the sensing happens in advance of the confrontation and the shock and happens remotely from the protagonist. Uh, another difference is the Volvo angel is saved in the end. She's free to run off to her meeting. Um, hopefully with more awareness about the world in which she lives, although it's unclear, right? Um, the main point actually seems to be that she can go about her life acting, trusting that something else is doing the sensing and watching out for her. Um, so Tomas, from whom we'll hear more in a moment, offers us another vision of how we might wake up to the world and orient ourselves to it. Um, his art is about dishabituation sensitizing us to our kinesthetic habits, to the world in which we dwell, to our entangled relationships uh, with that world and others in it. Um, his, his aim is, I think, to make us aware of our codependency, clue us into how our movements here can affect others' movements over there. Um, and it provokes cognitive remapping. Uh, in order to act, you have to reorient, uh, in, in his installation spaces, you need to reorient to the space and time in which you're acting. Um, as Bruno Latour yesterday discussed of uh, Tomas's work, um, the works can make us attentive in new ways to our world, make us see its time and space and feel its situations in new ways. So Alva, a phenomenally minded, if you can be a phenomenologically minded um, philosopher, uh, comes to us from Berkeley. Um, he is also a member of the Institute for Cognitive and Brain Sciences and the Center for New Media. Um, in his work, he stresses the importance of time and space uh, to human consciousness in a, in a related way to, to that of Tomas, I think. Uh, he goes against the grain of most in the field of cognitive science by suggesting that consciousness is not something that happens inside us or to us, but something we do out in the world. Um, and here you see an image from the website of the Forsyth Dance Company in Germany, which is a group he's worked with. Um, and something we might hear more about today. Um, as I understand it, he's interested in uh, how dancers think inferentially, a sense how to move and act with each other. Uh, for him, it's a window into this question um, of sensing and action, um, those being practices that happen not in the head, but in the world. Consciousness is an act, a practice, that emerges out of interaction with an environment. Um, and to think you need a body, to think you need a world, um, this, of course, evokes Tomas's installations. Um, just a little bit more on Alva. His books include Action and Perception, um, one called Out of Our Heads, uh, Varieties of Presence. And I should mention, uh, it doesn't say this in the program, he is a 2012 recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship. So one of the things about neuroscience and cognitive science that he pushes back against in his work is the idea that computation is the, the useful, the key, the driving metaphor um, for 
thinking about how we think, thinking about how we sense and act. And I'm looking forward to exploring um, in, in, in the next couple hours the tensions that might arise between his approach and that of Josh Tenenbaum, uh, whose work is very much about how brains compute. Uh, so I wanted to put that, that tension up front. I think it's a productive tension. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe it's not a tension at all, but some other kind of synergy. Uh, his lab, I was speaking now of Josh Tenenbaum, uses mathematical modeling, computer simulation, and behavioral experiments to explore how human brains compute and uncover the logic behind everyday perceptions and inferences. So there is still this attempt that's shared with Tomas and Alva to sort of in, to, to, to take what is that intuition and, and unsettle it, open it up. Uh, the fascinating question uh, that drives his work, or one of the questions, is how is it that when the human is given sparse fragments of evidence, computer-generated images um, of objects we've never seen before, uh, how can we so quickly categorize and recognize them? How can we negotiate uncertainty and intuit or make differences, uh, make inferences that enable action? Um, so his goal, as he describes it, is to reverse engineer uh, the brain and its cognitive processes. Before I wrap up this introduction, I thought it would be useful to go a little bit in a, a whirlwind tour of um, the, the history of this metaphor um, of, of the brain as computer, how we came to talk about brains that, can, that compute. I think it's important to what Josh is doing, important to what Alva is uh, reacting against. So very quickly, and I apologize for speeding through this, um, here's our friend Leibniz, who was probably the first to formalize human reason, reasoning as a symbolic process, a process involving the manipulation of symbols. Um, he thought all our ideas stem from this very small number or alphabet, this alphabet of human thought as he, um, as he called it. And he thought that complex ideas proceed from these simple ideas by this uniform and symmetrical combination that is analogous to arithmetical multiplication. So he thought human reason could, reasoning could be reduced to a calculation of a sort. Leaping ahead in history to our friend Alan Turing, a mathematician, World War II code breaker, uh, and father of computer science and revolution in information processing. He was influenced by Leibniz's idea that all reasoning is a form of calculation, and he proposed the notion of what came to be known as the uh, Turing machine, uh, theoretically capable of performing any act of algorithmic logic. Um, we should note that he here was describing his theories with a computer as mind, computer-like human mind metaphor, rather than mind as computer. So we weren't quite there yet. The, the human is still a model for the machine. Then along comes, uh, McCulloch and Pitts, psychiatrist and a logician working in cognitive psychology, they were inspired by Turing's paper, and they said, what we're going to do is create a logical model of neuronal activity. So in other words, they were taking Turing's ideas about digital computation uh, and using them to model the brain itself. So there was this sort of twist back. Uh, and what they wanted to demonstrate was that the physical structure of the, the neurons would allow neurons to theoretically uh, perform any logical operation, depending on the inputs and outputs. Axons and dendrites were the inputs, synaptic transmission the output. So in essence, they wanted to show that a neuron behaves following a digital logic of and, or, um, and other logical operators. Um, so this is known as the artificial neuron model, still used today as the foundation for uh, neural networks. Here we have von Neumann. He, in turn, is inspired by McCulloch and Pitt's description of these artificial neurons, neural networks. He described the modern computer, then, in terms of the human nervous system that McCulloch's and Pitt's had represented, inspired by Turing, right? Um, so you've got this looping going on. Um, he later summarized his view here in this book, The Computer in the Brain, by directly comparing the, the computational abilities of the central nervous system and the modern computer. Um, he described the computer as brain-like, but also made it possible to speak as the brain, of the brain as a kind of computer. So here you see this really taking shape. 
Um, and then as the writing of computer programs and software development um, became an activity in its own right beyond hardware, the analogy between brain and hardware was then complemented by the analogy between mind and software. Um, and here you have two who have uh, promoted this kind of analogy. Um, they argue that information processing or computer programming is a good way to describe mental computation. Um, so as an anthropologist, I find th this lineage incredibly interesting to see how this metaphor moves and is inflected by emerging knowledge and technologies, et cetera. Um, very quickly, here, thinking of metaphor, here is an image of the brain depicted, um, a, a German image, uh, as a factory. Here we have a telegraph. Here we have a switchboard. Um, film, I don't have an image of it, was used to describe the brain in 1920s Germany. Um, here we have from the Canadian neuroscientist William Penfield, um, the brain depicted as a tape recorder that could capture life's experience and then play them back when prompted. Um, and there's more I won't go through. This, this is the um, Turing model, the, the test operate, test exit model. Uh, equating cognition with a certain kind as a certain kind of computational process. Uh, here we have um, uh, the idea that information is processed in this serial fashion. Input moves simply to um, output. Uh, then more recent connectionist models that say, oh no, mental computation is not a serial process, but a parallel and distributed process. So again, as technology is developing, computer technology, new model that's being mapped onto new models of, uh, of the brain. So clearly these metaphors are, are linked to technological um, ev evolution in the technology of computing. So I want to wrap up now, um, but before I do that, neuroeconomics, I wanted to add to the mix. This is one of the most recent iterations of the brain-computer metaphor coming from this young field, which happens to have been the focus of my research a few years back. Um, I won't go into it, but here you have neural tissue is doing this work of evaluation. Our minds are sort of this wetware of, um, that, that performs calculations. And one of the key focuses uh, in uh, neuroeconomics is this question of how you compute the value of choices in time. So this brings us back um, to, uh, to, to yesterday's keynote, et cetera. Um, between something now and something later, as Poggio put it yesterday, we're extremely handicapped in thinking about deep time. We don't have the equipment to do this. Um, and the problem of the future, here you have a really interesting image. You've got this, this, this brain here, um, and then it's scaling all the way up to the planet. Chronic conditions, obesity epidemic, addiction, debt, back up to market crisis and global warming being figured as rooted in this problem of computing the future and relating to time. So full circle, we're back to Gaia um, and to sensing and to action, how to sense the future, how to sensitize ourselves to it, how to act in relation to it. Um, here's a neuroeconomist who says, we will be, with this data, able to uh, design policies that can mitigate self-defeating behavior if we do this research. But how, how do you do that? One answer is nudge, a neuroscientifically informed mode of policy design that starts with the premise that we're not equipped to make the best decisions about time. Um, another answer is devices that sense for us, protect us, like the pedestrian detection system we, we saw the advertisement for yesterday. Or to take my current research uh, on wearable devices that sense what's happening in our bodies and monitor our choices in the world and tell us through little vibrations or dings or messages when to slow down, even when to breathe, when to take a bite in the case of the smart fork. Uh, and finally, <laughs> finally, there's art. This art happens to be art created out by someone a, who's a member of the quantified self movement who tracks herself. She turned it into art. Uh, and of course, you'll recognize these images. Um, I just threw this up here to bring it back to, uh, to Josh's work and how something like what he does 
might also be a kind of sensitizing machine. So like an Auerbach piece or a Saraceno installation or even like a musical performance, um, dance performance, is there some kind of exercise uh, that could dishabituate us to our inferential habits, our inductive leaps, et cetera, the matter that, that he talks about in his, um, in his work. So I don't know what such an exercise would look like, but I, I wanted to put that out there. And I'll quickly review the timing. Um, it's going to begin with Tomas and then a conversation between Tomas and Leila, who's an art historian, executive director of the Arts Initiative at MIT and CAST, and someone who's had the privilege of attending four of his installations. Um, then we'll have Q&A with Tomas and uh, then a break to caffeinate and stretch. And afterwards, we will all uh, reconvene. And I hope there won't be a trickling in, but that we'll come back en masse, as Alva has, um, has stressed he, he would really like. Uh, and then we'll hear from Josh. And then from all panelists and a discussion led by uh, Carrie Lambert Beatty, an art historian coming to us from Harvard. Um, and you can read more about her work in the program. Finally, we'll have a last open Q&A period. Um, at this juncture, uh, join me in welcoming Tomas, wherever he is, to, to the stage. Hello, hello. Um, yeah, the beginning is always kind of uh, complicated for me. Um, I don't know. I was thinking today with um, Alvin Lucer. No, it's kind of uh, you start to kind of uh, find out who is sleeping, who is sending the SMS, how the echo of the room kind of start to resonate, and, and somehow it always take me a time uh, somehow to start and to find somebody who you can look in the eyes and. Um, and that's a little bit also how it's every beginning. Um, and a little bit also is like a, uh, I need to listen myself a little bit more loud, sorry. Does it mean uh, you see then adjust myself, no? And then I start to hear myself and I feel a little bit more maybe secure. But uh, um, nevertheless, uh, well, I'm extremely happy to be here and um, and a little bit the mood that I have been in these last days is not really much as a, a presentation, but was more, more a kind of a, a discussion. I'm trying to engage um, um, with um, some scientists here at MIT. And this means also, and I, I hope so, you know, all the kind of um, uh, simple story that I tell is kind of, at the end, will kind of resonate also in some of the words that we try to see. But um, um, one of the, you know, um, we will, uh, there are many, many images. <clears throat> Usually I always uh, try to say like, I would love that all of you have a kind of remote control from a television. And this means every time that you press the, the button, you can kind of scroll the images and I might be able to, to talk with you. Somehow, you know, what I'm trying to say is like, you know, how we can somehow uh, be aware a little bit much more one to each other. And somehow also what I kind of end up talking, it kind of disappear. You put down the volume again. Okay, then I get it closer. <laughs> so, well, let me take it out from here. Okay. Um, it's too loud? No. Okay. Does it mean? No, I, I think so. That will be interesting uh, exercise, no? It's like a, you understood what I said, no? Everybody press plus, plus, plus. I mean, I think so. In the presentation at the moment, there are 500 slides. Does it mean um, there will be a challenge also to arrive? But we can do also very quickly. And it's a little bit also what Bruno said, no? Also like a, some, from something which is kind of a still image, so something which is kind of maybe the, the images will start to move. And, and you know, in this kind of conversation that maybe we can establish from one to each other, let's say that we have 20 minutes, let's see when is the moment we will stop and when will the moment that, you know, kind of unconscious we might see to perceive something, but maybe it's there, but 
maybe we're not able really to see because it's too fast. Now there are these kind of cinematics, uh, no? 20 through 22 frames per second is something that you can perceive as something which is fluid, it moves. When you start to add more images, I think so now David Cameron is recording with 60 frames per second, but actually you, you don't see this motion, but there is something, you know, I think so they, they, they kind of uh, not allow anymore to show more frame per second because um, I think so Coca-Cola was always showing this frame. You will never see the frame of Coca-Cola, but at the end you want to drink Coca-Cola, you know, during these movies. But um, um, this is mean. Okay, then, then the other exercise I did, and, and, and a little bit also with, um, which I think so, um, well, I'm a great admirer of Bruno. I don't know if he managed to come up here, but uh, ah, here is in the back. But um, um, as a kind of uh, reframing myself, I thought like, a, um, I, I, I put the images and I kind of keep changing it until the last minute. Uh, this means I don't really know also what the images in, in which order are there. This means it's kind of a, it, it, it kind of all the time keep me very uncomfortable. Then I wrote something and then I could not read it also. This means it's kind of a constant exercise. I don't know how I I, I will manage to handle it, but I thought this um, is something which I kind of um, I enjoy and I do not enjoy myself uh, doing it. But that is why I say if I don't do it, I stop learning. Uh, and this means something which uh, um, I put it as an exercise, as all the time, you know, confronting with something which is a little bit uncomfortable, which is a little bit um, um, you're afraid of. And, and many of the installations that I do, I hope so, it happened this. And, uh, and I think so by being together and when you socialize with, uh, with others, and uh, it's something which somehow um, you stop to be a little bit afraid of, hopefully. This is mean, uh, um, how to say, could have been much more easy, but I think so Bruno made a great job besides saying that I'm very expensive, <laughs> but I, yesterday uh, on showing some of the images. <laughs> um, <clears throat> this is mean, uh, I thought also like the exercise I will try to do is like kind of describe a space uh, before seeing the images and maybe see some of the sketches that I was imagining. Uh, and also, you know, I'm very curious with, uh, with Alva Noel later, no? It's like a kind of, uh, maybe to invent a language or, to inv or try to see retrospectively what I was thinking and how I was thinking this space might react. Uh, this means I kind of start to know the language myself. And then, you know, then maybe we see the images together and then maybe also with Lila, that she had been many times in, in some of the installation and we have been together, uh, how we could, uh, this, this exercise a little bit I was posing to, to Lila, kind of to, to to form this imagination before see the images or, or the videos that we will see. This means very easily we can scroll through some of the images, but basically it's a, it's a pressurized space. As you can see, there are some people blowing down there. This means something. And all the time, you know, to have a space who um, somehow follow you, uh, it's kind of a science fiction. Uh, this means it depends on the amount. Uh, if, you, if you move alone, you might open up a certain, a certain amount of space. If you are uh, with two or three people, you open more. You see how complicated it is for me to try to explain something you don't still see. This means maybe I scroll back and then we see some images and we go back. Uh, but it's, a, it's, it's, it's kind of a space which all the time is in transit, no? It, it, uh, it's never, ver never fixed. And what is more interesting to me is like a space which is very, very hard to experience alone. Uh, this means a, this a state of codependency or, or kind of a relationship uh, is very, very high. I mean, here were some of the first models that we start to do. Uh, here are, yeah, we're blowing up air inside. Uh, we were simulating, um, we, we tried to do it with magnet, uh, positive and negative, of how people might be able to move in the space and try to perform, how the space will kind of change, but it didn't work really well. Then, we, well, we did very similar of what we were doing with the spider, kind of illuminating with the laser and try to see kind of a section. Again, remember yesterday, Bruno, no? It's like a try to imagine how people were moving through the space, but at the same time for health and safety, and security reason, they were really asking me to how this space might be able to behave. But basically, once again, no, it's like it's a huge cube which is pressurized with air. Does it mean um, the, the, the people which are up there are suspended in this, I don't know, I forgot how many, uh, thousands of cubic meters which, uh, which are down here. And at the same time, um, 
is not one layer, but there are three layers. This means it's kind of a lasagna, and we are the kind of the meatball inside the lasagna, which are all the time moving. Uh, and this means, once again, when we were saying uh, uh, how the space open and close according with the movement of the person, look, this, the, the first person in, on the left, you see that he's completely closing the space. I mean, you have to imagine how complicated it is to try to explain this in advance to the insurance company. <laughs> which is telling you, look, but, but you know what I mean? If there are three people here, there is no space, but then everybody will squeeze on top of your head. You know, when, when I say, well, you know, we hopefully people will be conscious enough that they will kind of start to foresee that somebody's coming toward them, and then you will move to the side, and then you come back. This means it's kind of a huge kind of uh, uh, trust on synchronicity, responsibility, behavior, uh, solidarity, uh, and, and, and then, and one thing also, w which for me is, is, is still difficult, and, and I, we will try today, and, and with Lila also, we here is Lila in the middle, <laughs> um, that yet to understand how it works, basically it's kind of it's a breathable space, right? It's a space which uh, every breath that you take, uh, it modified somehow. But somehow it's not so easy kind of uh, to understand it. Does it mean there is a moment that you kind of uh, learn how more or less it works? Does it mean... You know, I'm fascinated by the butterfly effect, no? It's like a kind of, but this is kind of a very simple. Does it mean even if somebody back in the room will gonna move, it will affect my position in the space? And I think so this is something which is uh, not so common. I think so the, the earth or the ground we have been walking since we are child uh, is, is something which it, it do not perform in this way. Uh, you know, the, let's say when you are in a boat, uh, let, no? If, I, if um, all people come here, well, they will come up here. But it's not quite the same, because everybody comes like this. Here is really, it, it measures the specificity of your, of your own weight. And it came, you know, one of the books which I like, which I was reading, is, is The Hidden Dimension. No, whether Edward T. Hall, when he started to talk about proxemia. And this, I mean, he, he described uh, all this book or how, about how is the perception of space in relationship with the cultural baggage that you have. Um, this means he make this book and then he start to put all this graphic where we say, well, between two Argentinian person, we talk five centimeter different. Between uh, Germans, you have a little bit more <laughs> different, and so on. And this means he does the same with the smell, with the hear, uh, and then, you know, it, it start to come up all this kind of intercultural relationship, but you don't know how much is the distance that you take. You know, one kiss, two kiss, three kisses when you say hello. But this is something that you kind of measure, no? And it's, it's possible that somehow you can uh, take a distance toward the person, and this is something kind of, uh, he, he argue and he make all this tabella. But at the same time, how much this is dynamic in space, no? And then he make the exercise, let's say, well, today in this room we will be naming uh, the president of Argentina, whatever. And then suddenly if she is the president, and I know that she became the president, whoa, no? There is a kind of aura between me and her. Right, because I, now I know that she became something else, and then wow, a lot of respect. Right, it's like oh, um, and this I mean, this is something again. It's something which uh, the distance which we relate one to each other, it's so much uh, engaged in relationship of the culture that we have been living, but also on the perception that we know and the, the you know the recent history that you might relate. Now, what happened in in, in kind of a, um, this space? Um, let me get to some of the images. Uh, yeah, here we are starting to fall. This I mean, one of the things which is very, very important is like uh, people should not get too close one to each other. If everybody get too close one to each other, uh, we fall, no? And we start to fall, and it start to happen this kind of social black hole, I call it, because everybody kind of uh, fall in the same place. And this I means something that you uh, very quickly, let me see, yeah, here you see this layer upper, it kind of really start to deform, and it somehow drag all the other people which are next to you. For by, uh, by this end, then it's very complicated then to start to get out. This I mean one of the, mm, well, here is one of the layer which disappear. Oh, yeah. and then we will show the video. This mean to to end up with this idea of uh, proxemia, no? Is um, I forgot now. I want to say. Um, maybe we watch the video and then I come back. But um, but. Uh, yeah, the distance that we could, ah, that's what I wanted to say. It's like for uh, the insurance also, and I think so, uh, Bruno also was uh, having fun of my mountaineers. Uh, 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 it's people who live in the mountains and they're very expert. We have to have them 
two of them all the time that this exhibition was open. Uh, in case of somebody get a panic attack or we have to rescue them. Uh, now, what we figured out and what we learned is like a, um, if you explain to the visitors or to the people or the participant or the, the, the person who will form the space uh, in advance, the rules of the game, they behave very badly and they do not f behave so responsible uh, and sensitive uh, between each other and between the other one. This I mean, what it happened when you get up there is like a, you know, first is, well, there are the, the fancy guy who say, yeah, yeah, no problem, and then he's the one who will suffer <laughs> more usually. But then you, then if nobody explain you nothing, it's kind of a, a quite uh, um, strange situation. Uh, let me put back some of the images. Because in, in at the beginning you face, uh, ooh, uh, down there, no? It's kind of a deep hole, you know? And if you enter in one of the first layer, the transparency kind of lose also when you get more high there. But somehow you don't know how all this situation will be. Does it mean uh, you enter there and then you move and then you see somebody else move? Usually it, it's happened that uh, there's a lot of solidarity right from the beginning because you knew that when you enter this space somehow um, you were afraid of. And you don't know what the hell will gonna happen. Uh, and, and you also, at the beginning, pass through a corridor of where I, I will get back. But does it mean that when you, somehow you are always attentive uh, and you keep a lot of attention to the entrance because you know that you came through that door and you know that you were afraid to enter in a space that you don't know how we, this space will change and react so much according with the relation with the, with the others. Does it mean what you always, I feel when people enter, you always keep an eye when somebody's entering. And does it mean when an older person is entering, somehow there's, I notice the, the, you know, the people kind of slow down a little bit and let somebody else enter. Because you know it's the moment that you can kind of uh, step because you cannot really walk, right? It's kind of you crawl and, and then sometimes you can be up, but it re will repent really a lot. I mean, one thing which we have to make very, very clear, uh, because I know that uh, how you will see it, everybody, maybe when you were a child, you have been in a jumping castle. This is the killer for my art, let's put it that way. Uh, no, because um, it happened very easily. We say, yeah, but Saraceno made a jump. Well, <laughs> let me put it that way. Uh, and, but it's okay because, and then with Lila, and I think so, I'm, uh, I'm interested also with Alva, you have to refer to some experience that you have had as a child to try to explain something which I hope so is kind of new to a certain extent. This means the first thing that you engage is, well, is the jumping cast. Well, I tell you, it's impossible to jump. Or if you will be able to jump, it's like, well, you know, all people around the planet Earth might be able to jump in, in synchronicity and we will change the axis of the Earth. This kind of uh, impossible thing that, well, it's nice to imagine, but very rarely might be able to happen. Now, let's put it that way. A jumping castle usually have a high pressure of air, right? It's something that you can jump. Here, the volume of air are the, I don't know, 7,000 cubic meter. This means something which is much more, you know, if I move, you have to press all the, the you know, the column of air that we have above of us, you know, I don't know how many barometrics, uh, millimeter of air, but anyway, it's just there, no? Um, and, then so, and then, you know, it kind of, it kind of we wave, no? It's like a, maybe I like a, to think about Alva Lucier, no? How this kind of sound wave kind of press the air and then somehow it move. Uh, and this is what a little bit how you sense the space. It's something which is, it, it take a time to, that this butterfly effect come back to you. Then we have to prepare a, a, a small video. I don't know how many minutes I talk already, 10, five, because I get always lost on. How, uh, can somebody help me? Make 10 more minutes, okay. Wonderful. I, mean, I did this video with the hope so, yeah, there we are. Yeah, two persons are heavier than one person, no? But then you get air inside. And you see, when you get air inside, everybody <laughs> fall on the side again. Now you open the door down. I'd always take care that there is an op the door open on the left. You see two persons, they run. Everybody drag to the hole. And how are you going to go out from there? Then you pump again air outside, inside. Then the people goes up and they split again. Now it is not one layer, it's three layers, and that's get very complicated, <laughs> I tell you. With the people entering up and down in the lower, this means it changed a lot, and, and then some must squeeze, some not. Once again. Mm -hmm. 
They put up it again. <laughs> but there are a couple of jokes, but <laughs> Uh, no, but you know, it's like if you uh, start to think, uh, you know, if we will build some material which are a little bit, I mean, let's see what happened here. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's just a little bit, that, well, yeah, it's too close to reality. Maybe this is why we don't love too much, you know what I mean? The other one is like, a, it's almost impossible, but that uh, we were on the threshold of uh, not really happening, don't close your eyes and be so afraid. We, we did all the, 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 the measures that this will not happen. Anyway, uh, this is get more like uh, on space-time form and what form might be and, and one, the title of the, of the piece. This is mean, I don't know if I, well, here where, where people are, are, yeah, are one of the situation where are collapsing to the middle. Now, one thing which is, is very important and I think so refer again of um, what what Bruno has said, and maybe I'm trying to rewind myself and, and with Thomas Poggio, and you know, um, somehow in, in some moment you understand, no, the ecosystem, the ecology of the space, um, uh, the environment. You know, I like uh, Felix Guattari when he talked about uh, um, three ecologies, no, there is environmental ecology, the mental ecology, and the social ecology, no, and this conjunction of these ecology is what, uh, you and today we mostly talk about environmental ecology, which, but anyway, there is a moment what we understand is uh, how it works, no, I move, you move, the other move, I take care that somebody's not stepping on top of me, I move on the side, but this is what happened, no, when somebody opened the door downstairs, and you don't see, that somebody's entered, and the two doors are forgotten, all the system collapses very quickly. It's like, brah, because everybody falls, because you are sustained by this breathable air, by a medium that you were, didn't realize at the beginning, right? Because nobody understood that you are supported by this kind of uh, something which, well, somehow we, we, we live on the planet Earth thanks also to this air. But it became, it became presence, no? I think so when Bruno talked also from matter of fact to a matter of concern, you know, it became really something that, Oh my God, uh, there was somebody else who was much more bigger than our interrelationship of how we understood space or how I move and the other move and you move and we move. The proxemia, all of this, there was something which was much, much uh, wider of our um, relation. Well, uh, ah, s s stopping over, but um, yeah, a little, I think it's too, too much. Well, the other thing is like very easy, no? There is uh, the explanation, but yeah. Can I show the other film? We'll yeah, wonderful. Okay. Good idea. It's a way of getting to it. Um, Thank you. <laughs> Can you get me on the other? Um, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to say I'm Leela Kinney because some people out who are watching us on the webcast asked us to identify ourselves. So hello, and thank you to those of you who have texted or emailed me uh, saying that you're participating from afar. We really appreciate it. So while um, we're getting this uh, video queued up, I just wanted to say a brief word about why we're focusing on this work and what it has to do with MIT. So this work was in the Hangar Bicocca, was in the Hangar Bicocca, which is an old Pirelli factory in Milan. Um, we, Thomas opened in 2012, just before he arrived at MIT as the first visiting artist for CAST. And we used this work as a basis to create this extraordinary network, if I may say, or I said to Thomas, he taught me how to weave a web around the various departments and interests at MIT. We talked to people in building technology about solar and wind and how it would affect some of these inflatables. He's also a solar uh, balloonist. We talked to the physicist about uh, cosmological ideas. We talked to synthetic biology, of course, to architecture, art historians, uh, STS. So it was a really sort of extraordinarily crossing or cross-talking, to use a metaphor, uh, from this morning. So what I want to do here is simply try to describe what my experience was in the space. I know Bruno is here, he was in the space. May I ask, is there anyone else in the room or outside who was in the Hangobikoka installation? No, well let me, <laughs> we'll, we'll hear from Bruno, yes, in a moment, but I just wanted to try to describe it. I'm not gonna be an art historian, I'm just gonna throw out one art historical uh, concept here, and that is this 
concept of defamiliarization, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with from Russian formalism, where it's just a technique of taking, presenting to an audience something that's common in an estranged or displaced way in order to enhance, therefore, your perception of uh, the familiar, what you ordinarily experience. And I want to say that to me, what this experience of being in this space and several of the others I've been in is this kind of full body disorientation. And, um, and how then you try to restabilize yourself and you notice things, and now I'm referring to a conversation we had this morning about impairment, the use of the sort of slight impairment of the senses in not only in formulating how our senses operate, but also in um, doing various sorts of experiments. So you have this slight impairment. You can't walk. You can't really verbally communicate with the people in the space very well at all. So what do you do? Then you turn to what I think cognitive scientists would call priors. What's the prior that helps you uh, operate in this space? So as Tomas was saying, could you turn on the, uh, the video? We asked him to make a video of um, the installation. And I want to uh, be quiet for just a moment so you can hear the sound of it, because the sound to me is a very important part of it. Now we can turn it off, and I'm just going to let it loop behind me. Thank you very much. So the most dramatic, and if they're frightening, moments are the getting in and the getting out, uh, because there are these ladders. If we could just loop the, the video while I'm talking, that would be great. Just loop it. Oh, it's going. Good. Yeah. So you'll see in a moment these ladders. So you come in on these ladders, and you plunge. You can't really stand up very well. So what do you do? I mean, you, you, you can stand up, but then the whole thing collapse around you. This is thick. Uh, well, it's not terribly thick. What is it uh, in terms of thickness, the PVC, the plastic? But anyway, it's, uh, it's, a, it's transparent enough that you can see through it. But, it's, but you see, when you try to stand up, you create a, a, a sort of reverse parabolic arch or something. I mean, it's really quite hard. And then you try to balance yourself. And so what do you call on? I mean, for me, I've done some climbing. I've done some skiing. You know, you're trying to call on these bits of uh, muscle memory to sort of help you orient yourself in the space. Ultimately, I think it's kind of a regressive experience. You end up crawling. And that actually creates a very different experience because you're touching on all fours. Um, or as some babies, you know, don't crawl, they scooch. You can also scooch through the, the space, so it's really very interesting. Now, you become, as Thomas said, very highly alert to others in the space because you need to predict what they're gonna do, which is gonna affect what you're going to do. And that's the other most close to traumatic moment is trying to get out of this thing because as you're trying to crawl over to get back to that ladder, if somebody else doesn't help you by sort of, you know, to making the, the space go down, you can't reach the ladder to get out. Now, there are three layers, as he said. It's interesting. Tomas talks about lasagna. I think uh, Bruno Latour, and there was a, there's a talk online of the um, session that we were all in at the, at the Hangar Bicoca, and Bruno Latour was talking about it as a Mobius strip. When we were here at MIT and going around, we were talk, talked uh, to Jerry Friedman, the physicist, um, Nobel laureate, contributed to the uh, discovery of quarks, very uh, devoted to the arts, himself a painter. He saw this thing and said, Tomas, you're exploring the curvature of space. So uh, anyway, it really is, and there are these wave movements, as um, uh, Tomas said, where you really uh, feel like you're, it, you're in a passage. So is it amphibious? You, you have this kind of, am I in an amphibious space? Am I under? water, or if you've ever skied in a whiteout, it can feel like that, too, because the sound, too, of the, especially in a ski, if you skied in a whiteout, you know, that sound of the roar of the blizzard and so forth is very interesting. So the layers, I think, are really quite important. The experience is different on each level, because when you're on the top, you're like, oh, 
there's a kind of release. You feel a little bit king of the mountain up there, but then you're awfully close to the top of the um, uh, hangar. When you're on the bottom, you know how you feel heights in your stomach. You're kind of like very aware that there's a concrete floor, you know, 20 meters below you. I think it's most interesting being in the middle because you can look up and down and you feel that you can control the curvature, the movement, the billowing, the waves. That feels most like a cloud uh, kind of experience um, to me. So I just want to say a couple more things and then um, ask Thomas maybe to react because he spends a lot of time in this space. You'll see him in here. He enjoys it a lot. I think he enjoys having trying to conceive the space, then creating it, seeing other people uh, enact, uh, enact the space really is what I would say because I want to say that this is what's so interesting. We call these installations, I mean, please, you, this, there's absolutely nothing passive about this experience and I think that's really, you know, for those of us in the art historical realm, one of the great uh, achievements of them is this, this full body activation of um, the participant, uh, the viewer, whatever. Oh, there's one more thing I wanted to say too and why I wanted you to hear the sound. So you're trying to locate yourself in relation to this space. The sound is the sound of the air compressors, the blowers. But the plastic is also, it's a very interesting tactile experience because you want to be able to use it as a vehicle to move or to t attach yourself. You're just kind of afraid, oh, am I going to break it if I press too hard on it? But it, does, it is also kind of warm and can warm up when people are in there. So it kind of feels like skin a little bit too. So this idea of spatializing the relationship uh, between people begins to have a kind of tactile uh, or resonance too. And I I don't know about you, but I've been absolutely fascinated by watching the signers here today. And the way, I don't know if those of you in the back of the room can tell that these two are aiding one another. They're communicating there. She's reinforcing uh, on occasion what she's saying and so forth. So I have seen this as some sort of really wonderful, beautiful metaphor for how one reacts to others in this space. So do you want to comment on that? <laughs> Thank you. So, how much time do we have? A few minutes? We're done? Oh, okay. So that's okay. We can go, we can go to questions. Okay. Oh, what, what, what? Yeah. yeah. Um, no, I was thinking, and I think so, what we were, time, um, because in one moment, you remember when we start to talk with some persons also, at the middle, in one th moment I thought, like, uh, what if we think about this kind of a uh, three-dimensional keyboard, uh, no, the space? Does it mean it's somehow, you know, if we can really kind of track sense, maybe we might learn also something, uh, somehow how we could be able to move. Um, I mean, and, talking about sensors, we were talking about Yeah, exactly. Sensors, yes. But if you think like, you know, the keyboard, uh, and then somehow every letter is a person, uh, you understand? It's really, think about the installation of being a keyboard, uh, where you, we kind of walk on top of the keyboard. And, but it's, it's kind of a, a three-dimensional keyboard. I don't know, I got this idea, which I thought it might be uh, maybe Interesting useful. to explore yes. in the oh next round. <laughs> okay, but thank yeah, you. Thank you. <laughs> you. So now we're gonna have um, Tomas and Lila, and I will moderate. We'll have about 10 minutes for questions. We're going to go a little bit into the break, but not, not too much. I want to make sure that the audience gets time um, to ask questions of Tomas. And if I could just start, so I'll steal the, the, the first position here. Um, I was curious as I was watching Tomas if you had, if you have other projects in the works or if you, if you thought about. Uh, yes. Well, I, I, love no, show, on this question. No, I love to show you one thing, yes. but maybe you know, everybody, everybody know what is this non-Newtonian fluid on a speaker, the cornflower, everybody know, if, if majority knows, I don't show you, because I think so, I, th I, I, I saw it, oh, yeah, Let, let's show it, it's like, it's so much fun, I, and, I, and I thought also because uh, with um, Evan also and uh, Arnold were thinking that maybe we, I, I'm, I'm kind of getting more and more interested in, in sound, and uh, well, I'm a drummer, very, very uh, basic, but uh, well, let, me, let me get it uh, because <laughs> I think so it could be fun to. Uh, uh, there's only one second. 
I have so many. Okay, here it is. <laughs> and I love this kind of uh, super cheesy. Uh, can we put sound also? Uh, it, it will be on. Okay, wonderful. There we are. A, bit, a bit louder? Yeah, more loud. Yes. <laughs> No, 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 no. <laughs> it's the computer that did it, yeah. The best part now is that. What are you? Here, click over here. Or maybe go back. I'm sorry. Two seconds. It came the best. Ah, I lost uh, the internet. The problem is the internet connection. Ah. <laughs> Let's see. I'm one second only. I promise this fun. <laughs> <laughs> no, and it gives also, and I think so, Lila, because she also asked me about why the title on space, time, form, no, and all these kind of... Uh, yes, and I wish Taubo could still be with us. She had to go back to the book fair. So mm. you two could talk about foam, those edge effects, right? <laughs> uh, I'm so sorry. So while we're getting that up, um, Great. my daughter was playing with Ublek yesterday, actually. It's, you know, you can, who, who's played with this in here? You hammer on it, it's hard, and then you can swim in it. Um, so, Tomas, so, uh, let me ask question you. For the public, no, maybe we, uh, we can answer yeah, Why don't we take some oh, well, questions from the audience? Could we do that? Oh, there was a question. Yes, there is somebody. Uh, she's the moderator. Sorry. Yes, question. To what degree uh, do you plan or have you done where you're actually getting feedback from the participants? For example, I would have loved to have heard new curse words or something from you had you had a mic on you. Uh, they could have had a head camera so that you could have seen things from their perspective. Uh, I would love to see what the EEG, KG uh, might have been and so forth. So the other thing is, uh, uh, since you can't communicate with one another, do you have any plans for setting up some uh, uh, here uh, headsets, uh, walkie-talkie type things so they can communicate? So I'm basically asking what sorts of, this is like a great space, and I was just wondering if, if you have any of these uh, things in your future plans. Yeah, l l then let's get to the video, hopefully this time. <laughs> it's gonna work. I just want to say, because while explain. he's doing, you got it? Okay. Then we need, uh, yeah, thank you. A bit more loud, if it's possible. Thank you. More loud, please. You know what happened if we uh, kind of, uh, you understand how human might be able uh, to aggregate one to each other? And I thought something like this, you know, you know if you put this music, you will get like a, 
You understand that. You got it, no? <laughs> I just want to ask you what, what, what the effect of music might yeah. my, my <laughs> produce, no? <laughs> this was actually an answer to, to the question I was going to yeah. ask, which was yeah. instead of uh, a space in which you couldn't come too close to each other, how to design a space where you would sort of need to or be forced to. And so this but, but I'm thinking the same piece of Hunger Bicocca, not the same work which was before. Let's say that now it turned to kind of a speaker, you know, because the speaker is a membrane who vibrate, you know, because so much resonance also with Alvin, Lucier have been talking with Bruno uh, and, and something that the space really depend how you tune it. The fluid, the non nutrient and liquid, uh, is it, we, we are the moleculars, no? And somehow you, if you put 110 megabars, you know, GIA, you know, you get this kind of vertical column. You understand? I thought yeah. it's the same space, but now adding uh, what we are trying to aim at. It would be hard to uh, get that past the, the insurance the people, right? Well, I, would, I wanted to say one of the things that we did talk about here at MIT, some of you know Joe Paradiso's lab, and I think I saw Gorshan here before. They work a lot with sensors. And we were thinking, well, maybe we could kill two birds with one stone if we put sensors on people so that the safety people would be uh, calmed down, that we could be monitoring people's reactions. Um, and uh, at the same time, you would get all this sort of data about how people were experiencing space. And he mentioned earlier there actually were two ski patrol guys in there because you can get in trouble if you get too close to the edge. You can get kind of up against the wall a little bit. And then people, again, have to help you, you know, by depressing elsewhere so you can roll yourself out Questions. We have five more minutes. Yes. Do you want them wait for the mic there? I saw a psychological demonstration uh, several years ago where roughly a hundred flies were placed inside of uh, a transparent jar, and the jar was um, gyrating constantly. Um, so their external environment is changing, and yet they were able to maintain their orientation relative to uh, that change. And um, anyway, I just thought it was an interesting analogy relative to this incredible thing. No, what, what, what I could I say, I mean, one of the things we, we are trying with Marcus, Bueller, and, and, and you know, I have this a little bit part of the other obsession is about spiders. And then, uh, uh, and now it's get really kind to, to social spiders. And we are trying to send social spider into the International Space Station. And one thing which I learned when they make an exercise of, uh, um, you know, when the, you put one bee into a weightless environment, the bee doesn't know. And then she starts to flap, she cannot really move because, and then she stress out and she die after I don't know how long. Now when you put like a kind of a, uh, many together, they kind of start to talk, and then, you know, until a kind of a very new kind of extreme situation that you don't know how to react, let's say, when Bruno called Gaia or what the climate change might, might be, you know, if, if you have a high degree of sociability among the animals, it seems that they are much more resilient and they will be able to survive much longer. So I don't know if I answered the question, but more or less. Yeah. Check everything what I said, because half true, half not. <laughs> <laughs> What you described seems to be an experience of the space. Uh, the only thing that you described that was purposeful was getting in or getting out, and you suggested then that people were frightened. Is there some difference there? I mean, have you asked people to go in and do certain things, and does that alter the experience? Uh, no. no. I think he actually. No, and I don't like here. really to tell people what to do. I think he prefers I really hate, you know, them like to a, not give rules. Although sometimes, yeah. he, like in the Dusseldorf, they required yeah, him to give yeah, people yeah, rules. Yeah. And then people behave very differently. Because I think one of the things he's, he, he's interested in is a self-organization of groups. So how do you start interacting with the people that you are suddenly plunged into this environment with? 